Hello everyone and welcome. I take you on a train journey around the world tonight, accompanied by soft train sounds all along. But in case you'd rather listen without these train sounds, this is also possible. The individual stories are linked in the description below. So, first, I'll tell you about the Orient Express line and the history of railroads, including the development of luxury train services like Pullman cars. Then, we will travel across the vast expanse of Siberia on the Trans-Siberian and apart from visiting cities along the line, I'll tell you about the history of Russia since its origins. And finally, we will go to America to relieve the boom of railroads in the 19th century, including the Trans-Pacific Lines and the fast changes that railroads brought to the American economy and society. Our train has just departed, and you are comfortably settled in your own compartment, perfectly undisturbed, and ready to enjoy the trip. So, please gently release the tension in your body, especially in your shoulders. Allow yourself a little smile, and off we go. Our journey begins on the Orient Express. This is a mythical name. It evokes luxury, travel, exotism, adventure even. It is the setting of one of Agatha Christie's most famous novels, Murder on the Orient Express. But what is it? Or what was it to acquire this aura? The Orient Express was a train service that started in the 19th century and connected Paris to Constantinople, or Istanbul, its modern name. The route changed several times, but the initial one went eastward through France, then Germany, Austria-Hungary. There were important stops in Vienna and Budapest, Romania, Bulgaria, and finally Turkey, the Ottoman Empire. At a time when obviously there were no planes and traveling by sea on a steamer from Western Europe to the Ottoman Empire could take a long time. These trains offered a fast and a comfortable journey for wealthy passengers who could afford it. They also offered luxury travel with comfortable cabins, fine cuisine, a lot of service. And this way of traveling was quickly embraced by the European elite, which ensured its commercial success for decades. Because it connected two opposite sides of the European continent, the Orient Express also became subject, over time, to all the political events, wars, redrawings of frontiers that happened in Europe and there were many from the late 19th century to the end of the 20th century. So we're going to explore all of this. But before, we have to return to the 1880s when the Orient Express was created. This period was the golden age of railroads and steam propulsion in Europe and in America. The invention of rail transport 
was already rather ancient. It's a bit anecdotal, but already in the antiquity there was a trackway in Greece from around 600 BC. It served to transport boats across the Isthmus of Corinth. The trackway was paved and there were grooves in the trackway that guided wheeled vehicles pulled by men or animals. Similar trackways existed later in the Roman Empire, like in Roman Egypt, but it was something intermediary between a road and a railroad. Then in the modern era, wooden railways were introduced, and there are many examples of them from the 16th century, especially in mines. They were used to transport ore from mines. Starting in the 16th century, the phenomenon of economic growth started to appear in Europe. Until then, production of goods per capita had remained stable and during most of the Middle Age, Europe was not a particularly wealthy region. It is hard to estimate precisely, but specialists in economic history generally agree that production or wealth per capita was slightly higher in the Middle East or in China than it was in Europe. But from the 16th century, this started to change. And not only because Europeans explored the world and global trade took off, it is also because more and more innovations started to be used in agriculture, in workshops, in mining, and productivity improved, even though this was very slow until the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. These mining railways were one aspect of these developments, even though they still used very little metal and they still needed to be pulled by horses or miners. By the middle of the 18th century, a technical revolution started with the introduction of the first steam engines. Using these engines to power an autonomous vehicle was still unthinkable back then, but they contributed to a large increase in iron production, mainly in Britain that was the first country to begin its industrialization. With the cost of iron dropping, wooden rails that were fragile could be reinforced with plates of iron. This increased their durability and the load they could bear. By the end of the 18th century, the first all iron rails were introduced and they were used to transport heavy loads in general, coal, iron ore, wood. On small distances, they were still powered by men and animals, but these innovations represented a huge increase in productivity. Along the 19th century, rails were replaced with better iron and then steel, thanks to innovations in metallurgy. This made them more and more resistant and cost-effective. And at the same time, steam engines were improved and they made it possible to build the first locomotives at the beginning of the 19th century. Prototypes had appeared before, but they were not very efficient because of the lack of steam pressure. Until an engineer called Richard Trevithick invented the high-pressure steam engine 
and used it to power a functioning locomotive. That was in 1802. For about 20 years, locomotives served only in mines or ironworks until the opening of the first ever public railroad in 1825, the Stockton and Darlington Railway. About at the same time, in the United States and continental Europe, railroad projects that would transport passengers were also being planned. The first line opened in France in 1829, in the USA in 1830, in Belgium and Germany in 1835, and so on, so that from the 1830s, a network of railroads started to cover various countries. This was slow at the beginning. The lines were short. The first locomotives were extraordinarily fast for the first travelers, but they would seem painfully slow to us. But the technology of locomotives made huge progress in the 19th century. Various national models appeared, but for most of the 19th century, Great Britain remained the biggest producer and uh, many locomotives were exported. The designs vary, but the heart of all these steam locomotives is a boiler. It consists of a firebox where fuel is burned. This fuel was almost always coal, and above the firebox is a barrel where water is turned into steam. The pressure in the boiler has to be monitored using a, a gouge so that no catastrophic accident can happen in case the pressure reaches the barrel's working limit. The steam generated in the boiler puts cylinders in motion and this energy is transmitted to the wheels. It also serves to activate an air compressor for the brakes and a pump that replenishes the water in the boiler. A lot of steam is ejected from the locomotive as it works, so it needs a water tank alongside the fuel tank and periodic stops to refill these tanks. Locomotives became more and more complex systems. They included a smoke box where pressure was kept lower so that all the smoke from the burning fuel could be evacuated. More and more efficient running gears, stabilizers, because if all the wheels are coupled together, it is not going to be possible to go through curves and the locomotive will lack stability. So wheels are mounted on two-wheeled trucks or four-wheeled buggies. These help guide the machine through curves. It is also necessary to have more than two or four wheels because the locomotive needs to transmit pull to the train and this requires adherence to the tracks. The first commercially successful locomotives were built by George Stephenson, a British engineer, and from these early machines, locomotives grew in size and power for almost a century, until the 1930s. During this whole period, steam continued to be the dominant power system in railroads around the world. So, from the 1830s, these first railroads that had served on short distances and only for heavy materials started to accommodate passengers. The first ever modern railway service opened in 1830 
between the cities of Manchester and Liverpool. Modern because the service for goods or passengers was operated by scheduled and timetabled trains. At the time, Liverpool was a thriving port through which raw materials like cotton arrived in Britain and finished products could be exported from Liverpool and Manchester was turning into a big manufacturing centre so the flow of goods and the people between the two cities was growing fast. The promoters of the line were pleasantly surprised to find that passenger traffic was uh, so remunerative and the success of this first line generated many other similar projects. Even though at the beginning, in the 1830s, in various countries people were afraid of trains because their effect on human bodies was unknown still. It all sounds a bit naive for us, but never before had people been moved at 20, 30 or 40 miles per hour, and this was seen as a risk to their health. Maybe it could displace their organs, affect their heart or blood circulation. These initial worries dissipated when it appeared that nothing of the sort was happening, of course. With the technical and financial success of these first experiments, a railroad mania started in various countries, accompanying and at the same time benefiting from the industrial revolution and economic growth. In America, the first line was the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, and in a few decades, until the 1870s, the US that were quickly growing economically and expanding towards the West saw a flurry of railroad projects. The southern states of the United States developed railways that were relatively short and tended to connect regions where cotton was produced with ports because their economy was based on exporting agricultural products towards Europe and the northern states. This kind of railroads that do not really create a network within a territory is also what European countries built in their colonies in Asia or in Africa. On the opposite, in the North and Midwest USA, the network connected the main cities between them. This was very detrimental to the South in the American Civil War, because their trains could not be as helpful as they were to the North. After the Civil War, expansion in the railroads didn't stop, it even accelerated further and railroads were built to the west, connecting better and better the far west to the east coast and helping integrate the US territory. With economic growth and fast population growth, demand for passenger transport was very high and railroads meant speed and safety for the travelers. It was never absolute safety. Trains could be attacked, but still, it was way safer than traveling slowly by a horse or by foot. Long distance travel by train in America could still take several days. It implied frequent stops to refill the locomotive tanks with water and coal and this meant that the conditions in which passengers would travel mattered. 
very quickly trains adopted the separation of passengers between classes, depending on the price they were willing or able uh, to pay, so that the manufacturing of train cars, including sleeping cars, became a big market, almost as important as the market for locomotives. And actually the inspiration for the creation of the Orient Express came from America and the Pullman Car Company. This company was founded by a man called George Pullman, an engineer and industrialist from Chicago. He did not invent sleeping cars, but he turned them into a phenomenon in America and redefined luxury and comfort for train passengers. In 1864, he completed the first Pullman sleeper, also known as the Palace Car. It was inspired by boat cabins. And Pullman was also an astute businessman. After the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, he arranged for the president's body to be carried on one of his cars, on a train that had several more for the president's family. Railroad companies started adding Pullman cars to their trains, and they were marketed as luxury for the middle class. They were more expensive, but still accessible to the upper middle class, in 1867, Pullman created a new kind of car that included a kitchen and a dining car. The food served on board could rival most restaurants of the day, and a lot of attention was paid to the quality of service. Pullman did not sell his cars to railroad companies. His company retained ownership of the cars and uh, managed the palace cars and provided uh, their personnel and service to the passengers. He just paid railroad companies to add his cars to their trains. He kept innovating. For example, in 1887, he introduced gangways between cars. Prior to this, cars were generally separated and you couldn't move from one car to another when the train was in motion. Sometimes there was an open platform between the cars, but this was not very comfortable and it could potentially be dangerous too. These covered connections between cars made circulation within the trains much easier. Pullman also absorbed almost all his competitors and their patterns, so that by the end of the 19th century he had a monopoly of sleeping cars in America. This pattern that saw a monopoly take over an entire industry was quite common in America in the 19th century. It happened in various sectors like oil or tobacco. The methods used by industrialists to establish and then defend their monopoly were not always orthodox or lawful even, and for a large part it is this situation that led to the creation of antitrust laws in the US. Pullman had a, a huge impact on how train travel evolved and his company also built thousands of streetcars and uh, trolley buses until it declined and finally closed in the 1960s. But the name Pullman remained associated with sleeping cars and luxury travel. In 1867, when Pullman was just at the beginning of his success, a young Belgian civil engineer from a family of bankers 
his name was George Nabelmakers, traveled to America and uh, he was impressed by the Pullman cars he saw. So that when he returned to Europe, he decided to establish a network of comparable trains in Europe, basically replicating Pullman's model. He would provide the cars, the service, and uh, commercialize travels on board his cars paying railroad companies for the use of their rails network and uh, locomotives. He envisioned his trains would travel long distance, otherwise sleeping cars and abandoned service would not make much sense, and in Europe this meant traveling across borders. In 1874, he founded the Compagnie Internationale des Wagons Lits, International Sleeping Car Company, and in 1883 he launched the Orient Express train service. This is not the only line his company created and operated. There were others, such as the Nord Express, the Nord Express connected Paris to St. Petersburg, or the Sud Express, the Southern Express, from Paris to Lisbon, Portugal. Of course, the train would stop in uh, as many capitals or major cities as possible along the way to maximize the number of passengers. The Orient Express was the most famous line it connected Paris to Constantinople, Istanbul. Back then, the capital and largest city of the Ottoman Empire. In 1883, international travel from one corner of Europe to another remained less safe than today, obviously, and relatively rough, including for passengers with significant money to pay for this journey. The Orient Express changed this. It became easy and comfortable to travel long distance by land without changing trains several times. For passengers from France, Britain, Belgium or the Netherlands, it was no longer necessary to go by boat for a long journey that was slower than the train and represented three times the distance the train had to cross. Like in Pullman cars, a lot of attention was paid to food, comfort and service. Typically, the menu served to passengers in the 1880s included two starters, three or four main courses and a buffet of desserts. The train, when the line was opened, had seven cars. There were two for luggage and anything necessary to serve the passengers on each extremity. One restaurant coach in the middle and four sleeping coaches, each of them with 13 to 16 beds. In total, the train could accommodate up to 60 passengers and it was easy to access the restaurant coach from any of the cabins. The Orient Express route changed several times and during various periods there were different routes functioning at the same time. One was a northern route through the south of Germany and Austria. There were stops in Munich and Vienna and the train ended its journey in Bulgaria. From Bulgaria, passengers completed their journey to Constantinople by ferry. Then the route changed and after Vienna it went through Serbia. There was a stop in Belgrade before reaching its destination. The world economy had suffered in the 1870s 
but from the 1890s, growth accelerated again in Europe, and these were prosperous years until the beginning of the First World War in 1914. The number of businessmen, diplomats, or wealthy tourists willing to use the service grew considerably. Even kings used the Orient Express, including the kings of Romania, Bulgaria, Belgium, or the Ottoman Sultan. Travelers from Britain, Germany, France, Italy could have their travel arranged to one of the main stations where they would be able to board the Orient Express. It didn't serve only for the entire Paris to Istanbul trip. Travelers could use it from Munich to Belgrade or Vienna to Paris, for example. About at the same time as the Orient Express began to operate, another mythical railroad was being built, the Trans-Siberian. In the 19th century, Russia completed its expansion to the east, to the Pacific, and to the south, to Central Asia. And then railroads were built and started to operate in the west of Russia, which was by far the most populated area of the country. The travel to the Pacific from St. Petersburg or Moscow could take months because of the huge distance. There was only a road across Siberia, but it had to be used with sledges during the winter and during the summer it was cut by many rivers. The project to connect east and west through the longest railroad in the world appeared by the middle of the 19th century, but it was completed only decades later. Russia did not have the industrial base and the abundance of capital that had allowed railroads to boom in America and Western Europe. But it was industrializing rapidly, and the opening of the Trans-Siberian was a sign of modernization for the country. It had a big impact on Russia. For example, millions of peasants from Western Russia and the Ukraine emigrated to Siberia as colonists. The entire trip in the 19th century from St. Petersburg to the Pacific coast still took weeks rather than days, but it was much, much less than before, and goods could also be sent westward, which accelerated the development of eastern Siberia. The Trans-Siberian was also a major strategic railroad for Russia and then the USSR, especially during the Second World War. It is this line that made it possible to relatively quickly move troops and, for example, bring Siberian divisions to participate in the Battle of Moscow in 1941. This is the battle that stopped the initial German push into Russia. Once the Trans-Siberian was completed, it became possible to travel by train from Western Europe, for example from Paris, to the Pacific, without using any other mean of transport. Considering that the first passenger train lines were launched on the 60 years before, and uh, how short they were at the beginning. This is quite impressive, how the geography and travel around the world were revolutionized so quickly. But uh, returning to the Orient Express, it suffered a, a setback in 1914. The service had to stop 
for four years, when the First World War began, the route crossed several front lines between countries that were at war, and obviously it could no longer work. So it was suspended, and business resumed immediately when the armistice was signed in 1918. The interwar period is remembered as a period of troubles and uh, relative decay in Europe. All the belligerents had suffered tremendous human and financial losses in uh, the war, and even though their economies recovered during the 1920s, there was a sense that the uh, ancient order and prosperity could not be restored. The exiles in Russia were gone, and Russia was now the first communist country in the world. Very old states like the Ottoman Empire or Austria-Hungary had disappeared. Families that had reigned on powerful kingdoms such as the Romanovs in Russia, the Habsburgs in Austria, the Hohenzollerns in Germany had had to abdicate and after an economic recovery in the 1920s came the 1929 crash and the depression in the 1930s that affected everyone. And yet, the Orient Express prospered in the interwar period and this is the time when it acquired its aura of luxury and refinement. Interior designs of the cars that now look retro to us were highly fashionable and avant-garde a century ago. Artists and craftsmen, like for example René Lalique, he was a glass designer, were contracted in the 1920s to update the cars and all their equipment from seats to table linen or plates and glasses into a style that was simpler and more graphic than the very ornate style that dominated before the First World War. Actors, singers, artists and celebrities from the interwar period took the Orient Express and they contributed to its aura, its reputation. People like Marlene Dietrich, Josephine Baker, Coco Chanel, Ernest Hemingway, scientists like Albert Einstein or Sigmund Freud, and even adventurers like uh, Lawrence of Arabia, and among the writers, Agatha Christie. She wrote the most famous story about the Orient Express, Murder on the Orient Express that was published in 1934. In this novel, which I'm not going to spoil, her famous character, Hercule Poirot, returns to London from the Middle East on the Orient Express. The train is stopped by heavy snowfall and a murder is discovered among the many colorful passengers. And Poirot investigates. Murder on the Orient Express is one of Agatha Christie's most successful novels. It is the archetypal wooden it story, but it is the gallery of characters and the background on the Orient Express that ensured its success. The novel benefited from the already mythical image of the train service and also contributed to it. It made it even more glamorous than it uh, already was. The outside design of cars, with the name of the company written in gold on a blue background, was also adopted in the interwar period. Murder on the Orient Express takes place on a new route for the service that opened in 1919 when a tunnel between Switzerland and Italy was inaugurated. <laughs>
in parallel with the north route across Germany and Austria. This one went through France, Switzerland, Italy, with uh, Milan and Venice, and then the Balkans. But the 1930s were the peak for the Orient Express. The service was interrupted again in 1939, when the Second World War began. And once again, it had to wait for the end of the war to resume. But things had changed dramatically with the development of airlines and uh, automobile. And the age of steam for trains was now over. The very first commercial airlines appeared in the interwar period. Actually, many of the legacy air carriers today were founded in this period, or they are the product of mergers between airlines created in the 1920s and the 1930s. This includes companies like American Airlines, United Airlines, British Airways, Air France or Lufthansa. These companies, or the companies that merged to create them, were already around before the Second World War. But after the war, in the 1950s and 1960s, air transport grew dramatically thanks to innovations like jet engines or pressurized cabins that made air travel faster and more comfortable. In the 1920s, planes were a terrible way of traveling. They were fast, but the inside of the cabin was so noisy that it was almost impossible to talk. It could be a freezing cold inside because there was no heating systems, so the passengers had blankets. The planes had to fly at low altitude because the cabins were not pressurized, so the passengers could not have bared high altitude. And due to the fall in the temperature, it was impossible to rise above a few thousand feet anyway. But all of this changed in the 1950s planes became comfortable, much, much faster than trains. A journey that took days could now take only hours, and long-distance train travel began to collapse in western countries. In the case of the Orient Express, it did not help that Eastern European countries now were communist regimes, and their frontiers were harder to cross. So there were lengthy checks that made the Orient Express slower than before. And then railroads in various Eastern European countries like Romania or Bulgaria started to deteriorate. Unpredictable technical stops multiplied and this made the, the timetables even harder to respect. The historical Orient Express service ended in the 1970s. The name Orient Express did not disappear immediately because it was used on other routes, but other than the name and the east-west orientation, these lines are no longer related to the historical Orient Express. The company that had operated the service for almost a century had already diversified into uh, hotels and travel agencies and was later bought out. The end of World War II was not just the beginning of a decline for the Orient Express. It was a general decline for long-distance railroads. Railroads were modernized and steam locomotives were replaced with diesel and electric engines. These were cleaner and much faster than the first generation of trains. But still not enough to compete with planes on long distance and individual cars on shorter trips.
throughout the 1950s, 60s and 70s, the number of train passengers fell in America and Europe. And then the situation diverged a little. Trains have never really recovered in the USA. They are still used as a cheap way to transport very heavy loads on long distance. But passengers tend to avoid them, except for short distance trips in very urbanized areas, like, uh, for example, around New York City with Connecticut and New Jersey. It is faster and more convenient to go to work. Trains also offer a quick connection with subway systems. In Europe and uh, also in Japan, trains went through a, a sort of revival starting in the 1980s. They were successful in uh, highly urbanized areas and also thanks to the introduction of high-speed trains. When distances are not that important, these trains can connect city centers as fast or even faster than planes because you don't need to use airports and as they typically go at about one third of the speed of a jet plane they can, they can be competitive on some routes The first modern high-speed train was introduced in Japan in 1964 It was the Tokaido Shinkansen also known as the bullet train But electric high-speed trains have a story of their own and this story started long before at the beginning of the 20th century the first experiments with electrified railways happened in 1902 and 1903 in germany at a time when steam-powered locomotives were everywhere and the speed of 130 miles per hour was reached with a prototype which was already more than the speed of most non-high-speed electric trains today. There was also a project, but it was too optimistic and never completed, for an electric railroad in 1906 between New York City and Chicago. The line would have been 750 miles long, and trains would have reached a speed of 100 miles per hour extremely high for the time but only a small segment was ever built various breakthroughs were made in the 1930s new speed records were established with diesel locomotives in the US and in Germany but steam resisted and by the 1930s the latest steam locomotives could pull trains that reached speed peaks at around 100 miles per hour. The absolute speed record for a steam locomotive was uh, recorded in 1938 in Great Britain at 126 miles per hour. The 200 miles per hour limit was surpassed for the first time with French electric locomotives in the 1950s and in the following decade the Japanese Shinkansen was launched it was by far the fastest functioning line by then using special tracks special tracks are needed they have to be built especially with larger curves for high-speed trains so that the train is not going to derail due to its speed in the curves there are competing high-speed trains designs today between the Japanese, Chinese, French, German designs the record for a conventional wheeled passenger train is held by the TGV, the French high-speed train at 357 miles per hour but even higher speeds can be reached with maglev trains maglev stands for magnetic levitation the system uses two sets of magnets one set to 
push the train above the track so the train levitates and another set to move the floating train. Maglev trains eliminate frictions between wheels and tracks which allows for higher speeds. The speed record for such a train is held by a Japanese prototype at 375 miles per hour. All of this means that the battle between trains and planes is ongoing. Trains have not lost yet. They certainly have for long haul journeys and especially transoceanic journeys. But maybe high speed trains can catch up some of the speed difference with planes in the next few years. But what is gone probably forever anyway are these uh, luxurious rolling hotels that Pullman cars or the wagon lee invented and uh, popularized. There is just no market anymore, no reason to be for that type of travel. And because that was the soul of the Orient Express, the Orient Express is gone for good. What is the Trans-Siberian? It is a line, or more exactly, a network of railroads that connects the capital of Russia with the Russian Far East on the Pacific. Its construction lasted for 25 years, between 1891 and 1916. More segments were added later in the 20th century which created alternative routes in some sections and it connected the Trans-Siberian to more Russian cities as well as Mongolia or China. The idea of building a railroad from Moscow to the Pacific through Siberia appeared in the 19th century because over time the Russian Empire had grown so much towards the east that it took literally months to travel from one side to the other. The conquest of Siberia had begun centuries earlier. We will come back to this when we speak about Russian history. And to connect this long expanse to the west, to the historical core of Russia, a road had been built the Great Siberian Route. In the 18th century, it reached the north of China, and caravans used it. This is how Chinese tea, for example, reached Russia. In the 18th and 19th century, it became very popular in Russia, which developed its own traditions around tea consumption. But it was still very slow and during winter month, wheeled transport was impossible because of the snow, so sledges had to be used. Siberia is relatively flat, and it has several major rivers, but they flow from south to north, and in the winter they are frozen, so they didn't really help connect Siberia to the European part of Russia. By the middle of the 19th century, railroads reached Russia, and the first main line for passengers and freight was completed in 1851 between Moscow and the capital at the time, St. Petersburg. The idea of uh, expanding lines to the Pacific looked like uh, a fantasy because this would have required almost 10,000 miles of tracks, bridges, and uh, other major works along the line. The Industrial Revolution was just hatching in Russia, and there were more pressing matters in the west of the country, which was more densely populated with cities that required transport between them. In contrast, Siberia had colonists 
and a few cities founded along the Siberian route, but it remained scarcely populated, with no major industry or flows of passengers. This limited its development, and in practice the eastern part of the country, on the Pacific, was more connected to Asia than it was to uh, the capital and Moscow. For example, it imported food not from Central Russia, but rather from China or Korea. In the second half of the 19th century, the golden age of railroads began, with projects all over the world, and the main Russian cities in the west of the country became connected, but it was slower than in the west of Europe or in America because of the huge distances and the relative poverty of the country which was just beginning an industrial takeoff. An illustration of this was the Crimean War. In 1853, the Ottoman Empire declared war on Russia with the support of Great Britain and France, whose main goals were to protect the Ottomans from the ambitions of Russia, the ambitions to expand to the south and to the Balkans. One of the main reasons for the Russian defeat in this war was the absence of efficient railroads and logistics, even though Allied powers had to bring their troops from further away by the seas to Crimea, where a lot of the fighting took place. The Crimean War was one of the first conflicts in history in which modern technologies were used, like railroads, the telegraph, or explosive shells, just a few years before the American Civil War. Russia was strongly shaken by this defeat. The country had acquired a, a great power status after the Napoleonic Wars 40 years earlier. And uh, now it appeared weak and technically surpassed by foreign powers. So in the following decades, a movement in favor of modernization and uh, industrialization that was led by the elite and the state, tried to make Russia catch up with Western Europe. The defeat was a catalyst for many reforms, including in the military, in education, or the abolition of serfdom, which was still a reality in Russia at the time. So now, Railroad projects by foreign and Russian businessmen were more than welcome. But when it came to Siberia, they were always about connecting the Russian Far East to the Pacific Ocean in order to export raw materials or to import food and manufactured products. And this worried the central government because it would have made the eastern part of the Russian Empire even more disconnected from the center of Russia, thousands of miles away. So these projects were all rejected, and in the 1880s, the Russian government began to seriously consider the construction of a line that would connect the two sides of the Russian Empire and also help develop Siberia and reduce travel time from several months to a matter of days. After 10 years of study, construction began in 1891. We will return to the Trans-Siberian and the regions it crosses. But before we do that, let's take a look at where Russia comes from. The direct ancestor state of Russia is the Grand Duchy of Moscow, a state that appeared in the Middle Ages. But prior to it, a large portion of Western Russia and 
Eastern Europe in general had been populated by the Slavs or Slavic people. The Slavs are part of Indo-European peoples. They come from Eurasia and the exact details of their migrations in the antiquity are not exactly known. But from the 6th century AD, shortly after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, they spread to settle most of Eastern and Central Europe, and the Balkans too. These lands were not empty of population, but probably because of their numbers, in many regions where the Slavs settled, they became the dominant culture and they assimilated the locals. In Eastern Europe, they occupied vast areas that Germanic tribes had fled decades earlier because of the Hun invasions. Their migration put them in contact with the Roman and medieval world, especially the Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantium. They gradually converted to Christianity, some of them in the West to Roman Catholicism, but the majority to Orthodoxy, the Eastern Christian Rite, and they formed the core population of different medieval states. In the south, in the Balkans, there was Bulgaria, Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia. In the western part of their expansion area, that is to say Central Europe, Poland and Bohemia. And in the east, the main state they formed was a federation called the Kievan Rus. This federation was united in the 9th and 10th centuries by a dynasty, the Rurik, that originated in Novgorod. Nowadays, Novgorod is a provincial city. But in the Middle Ages, and until the 15th century, it was a major urban and trade center in the north of Russia that could rival with Moscow. It declined after it was vanquished and annexed by the Duchy of Moscow, but we are not there yet. This dynasty, the Rurik, united East Slavic lands by war and diplomacy, and they moved their capital to Kiev in modern Ukraine, hence the name Kievan Rus. In the 10th century, their king, King Vladimir the Great, converted to Christianity and extended this conversion by decree to all his subjects. In practice, it took several centuries more to convert all East Slavic people to the new religion. But this conversion helped extend Christianity to what would later become Russia. The Kievan Rus was rather prosperous and uh, it developed a culture of its own, especially at its peak in the 11th century. It was very important as it created a sense of Slavic unity in the extreme east of Europe and a common cultural reference for future states. And actually modern countries like Russia and Ukraine and also Belarus consider it to be their cultural ancestor, even though the frontiers of the Kievan Rus only covered uh, maybe a big half of modern Ukraine and a quite small part of modern Russia. But this early Slavic state began its decline at the end of the 11th century. And in the 12th century, it began disintegrating into uh, multiple smaller powers, smaller principalities. What remained was weakened even further by the decline of the Byzantine Empire at the time. And finally arrived the Mongol invasion in the 13th century, to which what remained of the Kievan Rus fell. <laughs> 
the influence of Kiev was gone, but new Slavic states had become independent, especially two in what would become Russia, the Novgorod Republic in the north and the Grand Duchy of Vladimir in the east, which itself broke up into smaller duchies, including the Duchy of Moscow. East Slavic populations had not been spared by the Mongol invasion, and many were now subjects of the Golden Horde, a Mongol state that resulted from the invasion, or when they had kept their independence, the Slavic states were vassals of the Golden Horde and had to pay a tribute to it. In the 14th century, the Duchy of Moscow became the most powerful of these Slavic states, but it was still in the shadow of the Golden Horde, landlocked, and it would have taken a lot of imagination to see it becoming, one day, the largest country in the world. We will soon return to the Duchy of Moscow and its expansion into the Russian Tsardom and Empire. But for now, let's take a look at the Trans-Siberian Railroad and the main cities it connects on the way from Moscow to Vladivostok. Works on the Trans-Siberian Railroad began in 1891, as I told you at the beginning, and the line was divided into seven sections, on which work proceeded simultaneously. In total, more than 60,000 men worked on the construction. The south of Siberia is relatively flat, but there were still obstacles. The most formidable one being Lake Baikal, which is a very long and deep lake. It is 400 miles wide and one mile deep, so a bridge is not really an option. Special ferries were built to connect the railheads on either side of the lake until another section to the north of Lake Baikal was built in 1904. In 1916, just one year before the Russian Revolution, the line was finally completed and it was possible to travel without interruption from Moscow or St. Petersburg to Vladivostok. Since then, the traffic on the line has sometimes been disrupted, but it has been constantly in operation. The railroad system has shaped the demography and economy of Siberia between the end of the 19th century and the revolution. Four million people, colonists, moved from the west of Russia to Siberia and the population of Siberia mostly concentrates around the Trans-Siberian. Now Trans-Siberian is the name of the railroad system, not the name of the trains. They have different names depending on their destination and speed. On the entire line, there are almost 1,000 stations, most of them small, and only with local trains that connect them to bigger cities. The fastest train service on the line is called Rossiya, Russia, and connects Moscow to Vladivostok in a, a week. Few people actually travel between the two ends of the line. It is much faster by plane one hour of flight is equivalent to one day of train. But the traffic is uh, intense nevertheless for freight and uh, passengers alike between the main cities located along the line. After Moscow, 
one of the most notable cities is Perm. Perm was founded in the Ural region, the mountain chain that separates Western Russia from Siberia and is generally considered the frontier between Europe and Asia. Perm was founded in the 18th century to develop and populate the Ural. It became an industrial center in the 19th century and gained a major importance during the Second World War. When the German invasion of the USSR began in 1941, the Soviet government ordered major factories and industrial facilities to be disassembled and moved eastward to protect them from the invaders. This move preserved a large part of Soviet industry, especially heavy industries and vehicles and weapons making, and it allowed the USSR to keep producing and improving armament and eventually overpowering German industry. Perm received several major production facilities, thousands of new workers, and until the end of the war, it was a vital city for the production of artillery in the USSR. During the Cold War, because of its importance for the defense industry, it became a closed city where travel and residency were subject to restrictions. Then another major city reached by the line after Perm is Yekaterinburg further to the south of the Ural. Nowadays it is the fourth largest city in Russia and it was also founded in the 18th century and named after Empress Catherine I. There were two empresses called Catherine in the history of Russia. The most famous is Catherine II, also known as Catherine the Great. I'd tell you about her, but Catherine I is a lesser figure. She was the wife of Emperor Peter I, we will talk about him too in a moment, and she reigned for two years only after her husband's death. From his creation, Yekaterinburg became an industrial and mining center because the Ural is rich in uh, mining resources such as coal, iron and copper and it is also the door of Siberia. The Great Siberian Road that preceded the Trans-Siberian started in Yekaterinburg. Like Perm, this uh, city was far enough from the front line in the Second World War to receive industrial facilities, but before that it also gained fame as the place where the last Tsar and his family were held prisoners and executed. Yekaterinburg was a name directly attached to the time of the Tsars, so during the communist period the city was renamed, it was called Sverdlovsk and it regained its original name in 1991, after the end of the USSR. After Yekaterinburg, the Trans-Siberian crosses the steppes of Western Siberia, which are a mostly flat and open landscape. Several thousand miles further to the east, about midway between Moscow and the Pacific, we reach Irkutsk, near Lake Baikal. The west of Siberia is a mainly a steppe, but from Irkutsk to the east, the landscape becomes a bit more uneven, with hills covered by the taiga, the Siberian forest. <laughs> 
shortly after the exploration and conquest of this part of central Siberia, Irkutsk was founded in the 17th century, initially as a trading post for fur. It was fairly small, but it prospered for decades thanks to the discovery of gold in the region and uh, also thanks to trade with China. Chinese products transited via Irkutsk and the city exported furs and also ivory harvested on the remains of mammoth that were abandoned at the time. In the 19th century, before the Trans-Siberian arrived, Irkutsk was a uh, Russian equivalent to the American Far West. It is not as famous, maybe because this episode was not as important in shaping the nation, and there was never the same cultural industry as in America to make it mythical. But very much like cities of the Middle West and California, Irkutsk attracted pioneers, miners, adventurers, and it prospered, but was also a very violent and almost lawless region because it was far and out of reach of the central government. In 1879, the city almost entirely burned down in a fire and the government forced inhabitants to rebuild their houses in stone. The center kept this appearance since then and it looks like a typical Russian city from the late 19th century. Let's resume our journey towards the east, and we now reach the other end of the line, Vladivostok, a port on the Pacific, more exactly on the Sea of Japan. Vladivostok is less than a thousand miles away from Tokyo, Beijing or Seoul but seven time zones away from Moscow. It was founded in the 19th century when Russia took possession of a big chunk of the Pacific coast after a treaty with China. Rather than a treaty, it was more of a diktat. This was the time when European nations imposed a series of unequal treaties to China. I told you about it recently in the history video about the Forbidden City. Vladivostok was founded in 1859 and it remained small for decades until it was connected to the Trans-Siberian. At the beginning of the 20th century it uh, took off and nowadays it has 600,000 inhabitants. During the Soviet era it was the main base of the Soviet Pacific Fleet and it was forbidden to foreigners until 1991. Now let's go back to the history of Russia. We left it in the 14th century when East Slavic states were fragmented and under influence following the fall of the Kievan Rus and the Mongol invasion of the 13th century. Among these uh, Slavic principalities, the Grand Duchy of Moscow emerged as uh, the most powerful. Like several Slavic states that appeared from uh, the disintegration of the Kievan Rus, it was ruled by uh, descendants of the Rurik dynasty, and it had several rivals that it progressively absorbed in the 15th century. The most important one was the Novgorod Republic. Novgorod was just a city, but its possessions stretched from the Gulf of Finland on the Baltic Sea to the north of the Ural Mountains in the east, and Novgorod was a prosperous center of trade at the time. It was part of the Hanseatic League which was a medieval confederation of merchant guilds and cities that appeared around the Baltic Sea in the Middle Ages. It originated in the north of Germany 
but its success made it spread to the south of Scandinavia, to uh, the Low Countries, and eastward to the north of what would one day become Russia. Novgorod was a major provider of furs, of salt, of timber, and it imported all the products that were traded around the Baltic, clothes, food, beer, wine, metals. Its population was predominantly Slavic, but there was also an influence from Scandinavia. Vikings from Sweden had settled there. It also bordered the future Finland, and Finnic people also lived on its territory. The Grand Duchy of Moscow had the ambition to unify East Slavic people and repel the remains of the Mongol Empire, the Golden Horde, which in the 15th and 16th centuries looked increasingly weak and fractured. So there was a series of wars between Novgorod and Moscow that saw the Duchy of Moscow seize more and more of Novgorod's territory until the city itself fell and the Republic was dissolved in 1478. One of the most important sovereigns of Moscow in the 15th century was Ivan III. On top of repelling Novgorod and absorbing smaller rivals, he took the title of Grand Duke of all the Russias, and after the fall of Constantinople to the Ottomans in 1453, Moscow claimed to be the successor of the Byzantine Empire. The final fall of Constantinople didn't come as a surprise anywhere in the world, because what remained of the Eastern Roman Empire had been agonizing for decades. But this event was particularly shocking to Eastern European countries, because they had adopted the Orthodox faith and had had intense cultural exchanges with Byzantium. Constantinople was the seat of the Patriarchate too, the highest authority in the Orthodox world. There was not the same kind of hierarchy as in the Roman Catholic Church, but to the Orthodox, Constantinople was an equivalent to Rome for the Catholics and it was now in Muslim hands. Ivan III married a niece of the last emperor, and after the fall of Constantinople, he made the Byzantine emblem with a, a double-headed eagle his own. This is how this emblem eventually became Russia's coat of arms until the end of the Tsars. Moscow also claimed succession to the legacy of Constantinople. It is sometimes referred to as the Third Rome. Constantinople was the Second Rome as it succeeded the Antique Roman Empire, and Moscow would be the Third as it succeeded Constantinople. Of course the claim was essentially religious and political, because in the 15th century Moscow was quite far from the past splendor of Rome or Byzantium, but it justified the ambition of the Rurik from the Grand Duchy of Moscow to unite the Slavs and create an empire. A major successor to Ivan III is Ivan IV, also known as Ivan the Terrible, who had a long reign in the 16th century. Ivan IV inherited an already large Russian territory, but he doubled it. The Golden Hall had disintegrated in the 16th century into smaller states, smaller canates, and Ivan annexed three of them, Kazan and Astrakhan along the Volga River, which expanded Russia to the south, and Sibir the Siberian Khanate to the east, which opened the gates of Siberia to the Russians. <laughs>
This happened by the end of the 16th century. As a result of this expansion and uh, his unrivaled domination, Ivan IV was crowned as uh, the first Tsar, meaning Caesar, another consequence of the reference to ancient Rome. And the Duchy of Moscow became the Tsardom of Russia in 1547. This is also a major date in the formation of Russia, the moment when the term Russia replaced the names of cultural or political predecessors like the Kievan Rus and the Duchy of Moscow. Until the 16th century, Russia already covered a large area, but with the conquests of Ivan the Terrible, and increasingly in the following centuries with the expansion into Asia, immensity became a part of the country's identity. This meant very long travel times between the various corners of Russia, the constant risk of losing control for the central government, the struggle to populate and unify such a gigantic area with multiple ethnic groups, different religions, different traditions, in regions where nature can be quite hostile. It is not only the winters that are rough in the north of Russia. There are deserts, mountains, very wide and mighty rivers. Men look small in such an environment and the efforts to develop land are multiplied by the distances. To an extent, this struggle existed in large countries like America, in Canada, or Australia, or Brazil. But in Russia, it exists on yet another scale, at its maximum expansion before the First World War. The Russian Empire covered more than 9 million square miles, about 16% of the world's land mass. At the time, the only largest empire was the British Empire, and Russia was about the same size as the Mongol Empire in the 13th century. But these other very large empires could only stay unified, stay that big, for a few decades or for a century, before fragmenting and disappearing. Administrating and keeping together such a large landmass is something Russia has been struggling with since the 16th century. The 16th century was a period of expansion, but there were setbacks in the second half of it. In 1571, Russia was attacked by a coalition of the Crimean Khanate in the south, supported by a formidable power that was still on the rise at the time, the Ottomans. The invasion was repelled, but not before it reached Moscow, which was partially burned down. At the same period, the new Tsardom was also fighting in the west against a coalition of Scandinavian states, Denmark, Sweden, and its major opponent for the next century, the union of the Kingdom of Poland with the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. They fought for control over Livonia, a region that corresponds to where the Baltic states are nowadays. Lithuania is a small country on the Baltic today. But in the Middle Ages and the early modern period, it was a major state that formed an union with Poland and it dominated Eastern Europe between Russia in the East and the Holy Roman Empire centered on Germany in the West. This war was called the Livonian War and it lasted for 25 years. For the first 20 years, Russia dominated in its invasion of Livonia, 
but its success prompted the formation of a powerful coalition that defeated the Tsar's armies and uh, launched a campaign through Russia. In 1582 and 83, Russia had to sign separate pieces with the coalition members. It lost territories to Poland-Lithuania and then to Sweden that took its access to the Baltic Sea and made Russia almost landlocked. Its only remaining access to an open sea was now in the extreme north, close to the Arctic. Things didn't get better in the early 17th century. When the sons of Ivan the Terrible died, the Rurik dynasty died with them, and a famine started in 1601, and this led to a period of civil war and foreign intervention called the Time of Troubles. Poland-Lithuania occupied parts of Russia and even Moscow for a short time until they were forced to retreat by a Russian volunteer corps. After more than a decade of decay, the assembly of nobles agreed on a new ruler and a new dynasty acceded to the throne in 1613, the Romanovs. From this point, the country began a period of gradual recovery. And once the time of troubles ended, the 17th century saw renewed expansion. This period has also been called the Age of Cossacks. Who are the Cossacks? The concept is a bit confusing because historically there were different dimensions to this term. Originally, the term Cossacks referred to groups of independent Tatar people, who were not Slavs but Turkic, originally from Central Asia, and who had settled north of the Black Sea, in uh, the steppe, in what is Ukraine today. They were almost fully independent from any state. But later, in the 15th century, the term Cossack was also applied to uh, peasants, many of them Slavs, who had fled to the same region to establish self-governing communities. These groups grew in the 16th and the early 17th centuries, and at the time they were open to virtually anybody, regardless of ethnicity. But more and more, the Slavic element predominated among Cossacks. They were never a single political entity. They treasured their independence and their smaller communities. They valued freedom and self-rule. But they allied with the Tsardom of Russia in the 16th century, and they participated in the conquest and colonization of the Volga River under Ivan the Terrible, and then to the colonization of Siberia. For a long time, there was a tension between the Russian state that wanted to extend its protectorate upon them and uh, their taste for independence. They lived within the territory of Russia, near the borders, but they fiercely defended their right to self-rule. They were very useful to the Tsars when it came to defend the country when it came to colonize, and they also contributed to Russia's war effort, especially from the 18th to 20th centuries. Russian armies had Cossacks battalions, cavalry, that played a major role in most wars, including the Seven Years' War and the Napoleonic Wars. It doesn't mean they were always easy to control, and several insurrections, uprisings, were led by Cossacks in the 17th and 18th centuries. Cossack leaders such as Razin, Masepa, or Pugachev, who generally fought to preserve their independence, to abolish slavery, 
and broadly reject their transformation into subjects of the Tsars. So progressively they were turned into a, a special military estate, a military class, a bit similar to the knights of medieval Europe or the auxiliaries that supported Roman armies in the antiquity, with a specific set of rights and a status. They kept participating in wars on the Russian side, including until the First World War. But when the revolution began in 1917, and then the Civil War, they were among the first to turn against the Bolsheviks, they formed a big part of the opposing white armies against the Soviet Red Army. In 1918, some communities even declared independence and they formed republics in the south of Russia. But the Red Army won the civil war. The Bolshevik power effectively restored order in the ex-Russian Empire that was now the USSR and the repression against the Cossacks was fierce. The Bolsheviks initiated a policy called decosacization, a policy aimed at eliminating the Cossack identity as an ethnic, political and economic entity. It was not limited to taking their land. Under Stalin, in the 1930s, it took the form of physical elimination, as they were seen as a threat to the regime. Their numbers dropped, but they didn't disappear. Some of them emigrated, others hid or tried to survive under the new regime. And as a result, during the Second World War, their loyalties were divided and some fought with the Red Army but others joined the Germans as soon as they reached Ukraine and the south of Russia. Nowadays there is still a Cossack identity. It is considered an ethnic group in Russia, but several million people who live outside Russia, in Kazakhstan, in Ukraine or even in the US, identify as Cossacks. Even though it was always unstable, the alliance between the Tsardom and Cossacks helped a lot expand Russia in the 17th century. To the west, a large part of Ukraine was taken from Lithuania. And to the east, the Cossacks were at the forefront of the exploration and colonization of Siberia, where they hunted for furs and ivory. By the middle of the 17th century, Russian explorers had reached the Pacific and they moved past the Bering Strait, reaching Alaska in 1648. As you know, the Russians settled in Alaska and they turned it into a colony in the 18th century. But there were very few Russians and the colony was too far and too difficult to access, which motivated Russia to sell it to the United States in 1867. So Russia at the end of the 17th century was larger than ever, and the Romanovs had consolidated their power, but it was also surrounded with uh, enemies, and uh, when it came to uh, technology, education, knowledge, Russia was still fairly backwards compared with Western Europe. The country was very closed on itself, and its society had not changed much since the Middle Ages. For example, serfdom had disappeared or was in the process of disappearing across Europe. In Russia, it was still very much a basis of society. Technologically, a number of military innovations had reached Russia, such as guns and fire weapons, but Russia had almost no knowledge of navigation, very few universities and scholars, 
and a kind of intellectual exchange between countries and cities in the West was almost absent in the main Russian cities. Western countries had uh, embassies in Russia, but the country was too far away and uh, too closed to play a role beyond its frontiers. The isolation was also diplomatic. In the south, there was still the Crimean Khanate and the Ottomans that were hostile. And in the west, Poland, Lithuania, and a new power that had risen since the 16th century, Sweden. Sweden had created a regional empire around the Baltic Sea. It extended to Finland, Estonia, the coasts of Poland and Germany, and it blocked Russian access to the Baltic since the Livonian War that we talked about before. All this changed with the accession of a new Tsar, maybe the most important of them in the history of Russia, Peter I or Peter the Great. He spent his reign, which was long, 43 years, at the turn of the 18th century, fighting against Sweden to regain an access to the seas and also against his own country, to westernize it, including against its will. He traveled to Western Europe and visited several rival courts. He also understood that to play a role in this new world, Russia needed to catch up and westernize, to have access to the seas, to develop its trade and be open to knowledge and technology from the outside. The inertia of such a large country, where many did not see any advantage in changing their ways, was uh, considerable. The aristocracy had a power based on serfdom and was historically rather independent. It was an assembly of nobles that had chosen the Romanovs to rule the Tsardom. The Orthodox Church was also very powerful and rather hostile to Western Catholics and Protestants. Russian cities were small and in comparison with Germany or Italy, England or France, there was only a very small merchant class interested in exploring and learning about the world. So Peter was never supported inside Russia and had to impose a lot of reforms against large groups of his own subjects. It was a chance for his projects that he inherited autocratic powers and had the charisma and willpower to press with his reforms. He created a navy extended education, constantly invited foreign scientists and technicians, reformed the army and administration, and his reforms extended to symbolic measures, like forcing the nobility to follow Western fashion and shape their bills. He also founded a new capital, St. Petersburg, on the Baltic, that became the residency of the Tsars for two centuries until the revolution. But before he could do that, he needed to expel Sweden from Ingria. From 1700 to 1721, a major conflict opposed Sweden to a coalition of kingdoms that had suffered from its expansion, Denmark, Poland and Russia. The war was very uh, eventful, and at the time, pretty much all of Europe was at war, because at the same time, an even greater conflict in the West opposed a coalition of countries to France and Spain, the War of the Spanish Succession. But the Great Northern War ended the ambitions of Sweden at uh, being a great power, and turned Russia into a new major force in European politics. <laughs>
and the new dominant nation in the Baltic. In 1721, Peter the Great proclaimed the Russian Empire and became the first emperor of all Russia until his death in 1725. With Peter I, Russia had been transformed from a country closed on itself into a major European power with armies that could now rival its neighbors. But it doesn't mean that all of Russia had been transformed to its core. To an extent, his reforms remained superficial because he did not immediately change the lives of millions of peasants and this created a country where the ruling class, the elite, was quite westernized. So was the army. But the majority of the population was still living like before. And that is another constant characteristic of Russia in the 18th and 19th centuries. A gap between the country and its rulers. They were aware that they needed to show signs of attachment to Russia, and they did, very often sincerely. But still, the successors of Peter I dressed like Westerners. They invited Italian, British or French architects to build their palaces. They spoke better German or French than Russian. And they constantly had this concern to modernize Russia including against its will. The 18th century confirmed Russia's new status. After the death of Peter I, he was succeeded by uh, several empresses, including Elizabeth, who took part successfully in the Seven Years' War against Prussia. And the most famous of them, Catherine II, Catherine the Great, who reigned from 1762 to 1796. And the Catherine, Russia kept expanding. The Crimean Khanate was annexed, and Russia gained access to the Black Sea after wars against the Ottomans. In the West, most of the Poland-Lithuania Union that was now in decay was incorporated into Russia and the country shared what remained of Poland with Prussia and Austria. So that by the end of the 18th century, Russia seemed promised to a great future. It had more space and natural resources than any other European country, and more population too. At the death of Peter I in 1725, Russia had 14 million inhabitants, by 1800, 35 million, and it kept rising in the 19th century, with more conquests in Central Asia and demographic growth, reaching 170 million in 1913. Russia in the 19th century remained a great power, but struggled with modernization and a regime that appeared more and more at odds with the country. In the 1800s, Russia was involved in Napoleonic Wars, and for the first time in two centuries, since the Polish invasion during the time of troubles, a foreign army marched on Moscow and captured it. But it is in Russia that Napoleon's ambitions died too. Revolutionary France and then the French Empire created by Napoleon were faced with several coalitions. Russia took part in the Third Coalition in 1805 that gathered Great Britain, Austria, Russia and other smaller countries. The coalition benefited from the Royal Navy that controlled the seas and prevented Napoleon from invading Great Britain. So he turned against continental powers and the outcome was disastrous for them. In 1805, 
Napoleon's main army moved into Germany, and after several victories, it destroyed a combined Austrian and Russian force, and the Tsar Alexander I at the Battle of Austerlitz near Vienna. Napoleon imposed a very harsh peace on Austria, but he spared Russia that he hoped to turn into an ally. After Austerlitz, the Third Coalition was over, even though no peace was signed with Great Britain and Russia. But the next year, a Fourth Coalition appeared. Austria stayed out of it, but this time Prussia joined, and uh, the main other belligerents were still Great Britain and Russia. Napoleon quickly moved against Prussia, which was crushed in a few weeks, and Berlin occupied, and then he moved against Russia. The Russian armies did better this time. They resisted at the Battle of Ilo, which was uh, inconclusive. But Napoleon halted to receive reinforcements, and in 1807 he obtained a decisive victory at the Battle of Friedland, near the Russian frontier. Russia had to ask for a truth, and uh, switch side. The country made peace with uh, France, not for long, and uh, it allied with it. Most of the losses of the Fourth Coalition were supported by Prussia, and Russia escaped the conflict almost intact, except for its pride. A few years passed, during which a Fifth Coalition raised against Napoleon, this time with Austria, which again was beaten at the Battle of Wagram, leaving only Great Britain, Spain and Portugal that were occupied but in revolt at war with France. Until 1812, when Napoleon was displeased that his ally, Russia, was routinely violating the blockers it was supposed to observe against Great Britain, and it seemed only a matter of time before Russia would turn against Napoleon. So in 1812, Napoleon launched a preemptive invasion of Russia that turned out to be his worst miscalculation. Napoleon's force, which was called the Grande Armée, the Great Army, had grown to one million men. This size has been surpassed since then. But at the time it was probably the largest invading force ever assembled and almost 700,000 participated in the invasion of Russia. The Grande Armée marched on Moscow and won a number of minor engagements on the way, but the Russians avoided major battles that they could lose, and they kept refusing to sign peace when the French took Moscow. In October 1812, after one month of waiting for a peace offer that never came, Napoleon had to abandon Moscow and begin a retreat because Russia was just too big to be entirely occupied and the Russians were still refusing a decisive battle. They counted on the winter, the distance and uh, their policy of destroying uh, any resources that the French could have captured to do the work for them, and it worked. As uh, winter came, the Grande Armée lost thousands, then uh, tens of thousands, and ultimately 95% of its headcount to the cold, the hunger, diseases and uh, skirmishes that the Russians provoked on its way back to uh, the West. This retreat of Russia was the beginning of the end for Napoleon, because seeing an opportunity, all the belligerents from previous coalitions rose again in a sixth coalition. There was still Great Britain and Russia, now joined by Austria, Prussia, Sweden, Spain, Portugal, several German states. 
and this time it worked. In 1814, after two years of battles all across Europe, France was invaded and Napoleon sent into exile. The coalition had a little scare the next year, when Napoleon escaped and came back to France, rose an army again, but descended for good at Waterloo the same year. And in the Congress that followed to reorganize Europe in post-Napoleonic times, Russia was one of the main victors. Russian armies had played a key role in ending Napoleonic wars, and the prestige of the Tsar in Europe reached a new high. There had always been recurring uprisings against the central power of the Tsars in the previous centuries. I told you earlier about Cossacks' rebellions, for example. But in the 19th century, this took a new form, because liberal ideas had spread across Europe and they had reached Russia. Politically, all European countries evolved significantly in the 19th century. In a general process of political liberalization that was more or less complicated. Some became democracies relatively peacefully, like the UK, or through various revolutions like France. Others remained more authoritarian, like Germany or Austria-Hungary, but they still had to make concessions with elected assemblies and forms of representations for their populations, like political parties and trade unions. Russia had a hard time adapting its regime in this new world. Some of the Tsars, like Alexander II, were rather liberal and willing to reform, but the conservatism of some parts of Russian society and the multiplicity of ethnicities and traditions in an empire that was bigger than ever, the distances, the fact that there was an elite that for a part was liberal, but this elite was quite disconnected from the rest of the population, the mistrust for Western values too. All of this made the task of progressively reforming Tsarist Russia extremely difficult, and indeed it failed. By the end of the 19th century, these internal tensions were getting worse, not better. On the one hand, Russia was entering a period of fast industrialization, and the construction of the Trans-Siberian is one aspect of it. But Russian society was increasingly conflictual, and the power of the Tsars was clearly threatened. The prestige of Russia had been dented by the Crimean War in 1854. I told you about it at the beginning. But a worse defeat uh, occurred in 1905 against Japan in the East. This war triggered a major revolt in 1905 that forced the Tsar, Nicholas II, to uh, concede reforms like freedoms of speech and assembly, or the legalization of political parties. But that was not entirely made effective, and when the First World War started in 1914, Russia entered it in a state of internal weakness. The burden of the war, and more defeats against the Germans, discredited the regime enough to lead to the first revolution in 1917 that ended the Romanov dynasty. After the civil war, the Bolsheviks prevailed and the Soviet Union replaced Imperial Russia. I keep 20th century history for another time, another story I want to make about the USSR including the Second World War and what happened after 1945.
into the 1980s. The Trans-Siberian had been built to develop land in Siberia to connect the two sides of an immense country for political, strategic and economic reasons. And this is exactly what it did, but for the Soviet Union. In the 20th century, the railroad system was expanded, connected to China, Mongolia, North Korea. It was electrified and it became a major transport axis for the USSR and Russia after the end of the USSR. Let's begin our story in 1830, in Baltimore, where and when the first railroad in the United States was inaugurated, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. The United States of 1830 were obviously very different from what they would become along the rest of the century. At the time, the country had just 13 million inhabitants, a number that had been growing very fast since independence. But the country was still essentially rural and agrarian. Out of these 13 million souls, 2 million lived in the state of New York, the most populated, followed by Pennsylvania and Virginia. New York City had just reached 200,000 inhabitants and it was by far the largest city in the country, followed by Baltimore and Philadelphia with around 80,000. Two million out of 13 million were slaves, mainly in southern states. And the country actually occupied only a third of its current size the most eastern third. All the rest was claimed territory, claimed by the US, by Mexico or Great Britain. At the time there were no large factories and the economy was still based on agriculture mainly, for local production and also cash crops for export especially in the south, that were booming to satisfy European and local demand, cotton, tobacco, dyes. The Industrial Revolution was speeding up in Great Britain and taking off in Western Europe. America was culturally and economically very connected to Europe, of course and with the constant flow of migrants, rich and poor, this ensured that labor, know-how, techniques and capital were available. So were raw materials, in abundance, all the ingredients for the country to begin an industrial revolution of its own. And this was burgeoning in 1830 impulsed by local investors and uh, entrepreneurs who uh, had accumulated capital from trade, banking or plantations. There was already a sense among the elite and also a majority of migrants that this was an extraordinary land of opportunities and indeed it wouldn't disappoint in the following decades at least for those who manage to seize or create these opportunities. Another certainty that dominated at the time was the need for the country to build itself up, to organize this gigantic and growing space that was still scarcely populated and nothing should stand in the way of this project, not the geography that would be transformed with ways of communication like new roads and canals. For example, the national road that connected the Potomac and Ohio rivers had been started in 1811 
and in 1830 works were going on on it. Nature would not stop expansion and nor would people. 1830 was the year when the Indian Removal Act was signed into law, authorizing the expulsion of all Native American tribes from the east to the west of the Mississippi so that their lands could be occupied by settlers and it was strongly enforced. This is the context in which railroads were built for the first time and train services put into place, investors willing to develop new businesses, the government encouraging the development of its national territory and the need to carry around raw materials, manufactured goods, and passengers too. The very first train services followed and copied British railroad technology. I told you about it in the video about the Orient Express. The link is in the description. Because at the time, this was the pioneer industry but manufacturing of local equipment, especially locomotives, followed quickly in the 1830s. The first fully American locomotive was produced by the end of 1830 in the state of New York for another new railroad company from South Carolina, and it was called the best friend of Charleston. It was used along a six-mile demonstration route, on which it impressed people because it could reach a speed of 15 to 25 miles per hour, that is 25 to 40 kilometers per hour. That was high speed in 1830. The only mode of travel that could go faster than that was a very experienced horse and rider, but not much faster. At the time, in all countries where railroads appeared, they were an attractive but also a frightening novelty. In the UK and France, for example, there were calls to caution, including by some physicians, because the effects of such speeds on human bodies were unknown. What if traveling at 20 or 30 miles per hour for several minutes could kill people or make them sick? And what if they fell from the trains? For safety, the first passenger cars in France were locked so that the passengers could not open the doors from the inside, which in fact was very dangerous because in case of a fire or an accident, they would not be able to evacuate. But there was also curiosity, and in the 1830s, when trains were still very new, it was common for people to try them as an attraction rather than a means of transport. This first American locomotive, the best friend of Charleston, was also the first to suffer a boiler explosion in America. It was steam-powered, of course, like all locomotives from the 19th century. So the energy came from a boiler, where heat turned water into steam. But the internal pressure had to remain within certain limits, like all boilers, so that it could be uh, contained. There was a valve for pressure release and it whistled. This is where the whistle sound of steam locomotives comes from. It seems in the case of this accident, the fireman had grown tired of listening to it whistle. So to stop the noise, he closed the valve. Not a good idea, of course. The pressure within the boiler exceeded its capacity and it exploded. This accident eroded confidence in the public, so to restore it, in the 1830s it was common in the first trains 
to place a flat car piled with cotton bales between the locomotive and the other passenger cars so that the passengers were shielded in case something happened to the locomotive. Along the 1830s and 40s, more lines were built and operated, especially in the northeast around the industrial centers and in the south, but with different logics. The network in the north was designed primarily to bring raw materials like coal and iron to factories, connect them with ports, and also there was a larger market for passengers because they were more densely populated. Cities were absolutely booming at the time. I told you that New York City had 200,000 inhabitants in 1830. In 1850, this number had increased, it had tripled to 600,000. And in 1900, there would be more than 3 million. But some cases were even more impressive. Chicago in 1840 was just a big village with 4,000 souls. In 30 years, it became a respectable city of 300,000 by 1870, and in 1900, it had 1.7 million inhabitants. American cities in the Northeast had a very impressive growth rates in the 19th century, because they received a large part of European migrants from Germany, Italy, Scandinavia, Ireland, and also former black slaves who moved north after the Civil War, where industry was hiring new workers by millions and needed ever more arms. Between these large cities, the need for transport was constantly growing. In the southeast of the country, industrialization was much less systematic, population was less dense, and the economy remained much more agrarian. The main exports were cash crops, and so railroads were used primarily to transport them to the coast or to the closest waterway, which is also typical of the railroads that Europeans funded and built in their colonies. They were meant to carry raw materials to ports from where they could be shipped to factories on another continent. So they didn't create a network to connect different points of the local market. We'll talk about it later. But this was a major problem for southern states during the Civil War. The North had a very developed and integrated railroad network that could be used to transport troops and equipment across its territory, whereas the South could often not rely on its railroads that were less dense and not designed to unify its territory. Even before and after the Civil War, it was impossible to send cotton to cotton mills in the North entirely by train. Cotton was sent to a port on the Atlantic coast or the Gulf of Mexico and then shipped by boat to New York, Boston, Philadelphia or Baltimore to be processed. By the 1850s, there were now 9,000 miles of railroad lines in the United States. That's about 14,000 kilometers. It was more than England or France, but on a much larger territory. So the density of the network was not that high yet. And the government wished to accelerate the move, the development of railroads. With technical progress that improved speeds, 
railroads were increasingly replacing horse or stagecoach in the northeast, and also for travels from the east coast to the Middle West. But beyond the Mississippi Basin, everything remained to be built, and the great migration to the west of the years 1830, 40, 50, was made essentially with horses and wagons. I told you about this in the story about the Donner Party. I will also put the link in the description. To stimulate development to the west, an approach favored by the government was land grants. The government gifted land, or its use privileges, to make people settle and develop it. So new railroad companies were given millions of acres in the West in the years 1850s and 60s. This industry picked up speed and this provided the basis for faster expansion, a railroad mania and a number of transformations in American society that went well beyond railroads themselves. A number of inland cities had been turned into sorts of inland ports, thanks to their connection by train. People could transit through them before going further west. It made sense to build factories or warehouses, because they could receive materials and send manufactured goods away. This is how inland cities like Chicago experienced tremendous growth. Railroads could be operated all year round, contrary to boats on many rivers and canals. They were also more flexible because they could reach almost any destination. So after having replaced stagecoaches and wagons on main lines, they competed with and progressively eliminated steamboats in the second half of the 19th century. As railroads kept expanding, the Civil War burst in 1861 and raged for four years until 1865. The central cause of the war, as you know, was the status of slavery, not just its existence in southern states, that defended it, but in new states that were being formed in the West. And there were also other sources of divergence between southern and northern states. The level of independence of states within the Union, the very different economies, the North was more protectionist, Manufacturing interests in states that had industrialized approved protectionism, whereas the South was in favor of free trade because its elite lived from a large part on exports. There were also cultural and political differences. In the North, patriotic support for the Union was quite strong whereas the South was more split between those loyal to the entire United States and those loyal to the Southern region. The South was also often portrayed in terms that were less than flattering in the North as a backwards, ignorant region, which only reinforced the sense of cultural and political separation from the North in Southern states. Finally, when Abraham Lincoln was elected president in 1860, this was the final trigger for secession. Southern states feared that he would completely stop the expansion of slavery in new states and put it on a course toward extinction. Given the demographics and political situation, the South faced a future as a perpetual minority within the Union. And so, even before Lincoln took office in 1861, seven states had declared their secession and joined 
to form the Confederacy. They were joined by four more, totaling 11 states out of 34. Based on population, economy, and industrial capacity, the war was very unbalanced in favor of the North, and railroads were one of the reasons. As I said before, the North had at its disposal a dense and better designed network to transport troops and move equipment around. In contrast, in the South, lines connected cotton regions with waterways or the coast. They had less military value, and almost all the railroad industry was in the North, so between the lack of spare parts and the destruction of the war, which was thought essentially in the South, railroads collapsed in the South and couldn't support the war effort. After the war, when Reconstruction began, the Southern network was expanded dramatically but mainly by northern companies and interests. But even before the Civil War was over, the government of the Union was planning for railroads to be expanded westward, so that the Atlantic and Pacific coasts would finally be connected. This was a decades-long dream. There had been a movement of population to the West since the 1830s. But reaching California or Oregon from the eastern United States was very complicated. There were two possible routes. One by the sea, but it was ridiculously long. The Panama Canal did not exist yet. So ships had to travel all the way to the south of South America pass through Cape Horn to the south of Argentina and Chile, enter the Pacific, and then go north all the way up to North America. It was expensive. It took weeks even on steamboats. And there were multiple stops along the way. That was very impractical. The alternative was by land. But at the time there were only very basic roads or tracks, but this is the way hundreds of thousands of migrants traveled through the Middle West and the Rocky Mountains, with wagons carrying all their possessions and families. The appeal of a transcontinental line, or several, was obvious, but this meant thousands of miles of tracks and a huge investment. This was one of the projects that changed the scale of the railroads industry. It required large public companies funded on the financial market by stock and bondholders. In the years 1860s and 70s, the need for workers to build and operate railroads was considerable. This was the time when tens of thousands of Chinese and Irish workers were hired work on the tracks, and railroads became the biggest employers in America, second only to agriculture. In 1869, the first transcontinental railroad was opened. It connected the existing eastern network with the Pacific coast. The starting point of the new line was in Iowa, and it reached San Francisco the time to travel from one coast to the other dropped to only six days, which was crucial to integrate the American territory in a single economy, a single market, and also control it. Other transcontinental lines followed shortly after, one to the south, through Texas and New Mexico, to South California and one to the north, following the frontier with Canada. Now, the development of railroads had uh, many other consequences than just lines of tracks. Consequences that are 
may be less visible, but deeper and really interesting to look at. It is hard to overstate how railroads transformed the United States. They had repercussions on many levels on American society and economy. So let's take a look at all these aspects before we return to the chronology. First, the multiplication of railroads created a single market, which is very important for a modern country to hold together. Prior to the development of railroads, national economies were very fragmented. Of course, there was trade and transportation of goods on trade routes, like waterways, and roads on shorter distances. But this was slow and expensive. So in practice, for most goods, the economy was very local. Not just in America, it was the case all over the world. But this was even truer in the United States because of the size of the country. Until the opening of train lines, California or Texas were barely connected economically to the Northeast. There was a movement of people, political entity, but very few economic activity between states that were far apart. This completely changed when New York City and San Francisco became connected in less than a week. A factory from New York or Pennsylvania would now send goods to the other side of the country in a matter of days. So this boosted growth for industrial businesses by opening them a much larger market. With railroads came much larger factories with thousands of workers, a concentration that had never been seen before to make economies of scale and uh, satisfy this uh, much bigger demand. This didn't go without new problems. American capitalism in the 19th century saw spectacular fortunes emerge in various industries based on huge companies that established monopolies or oligopolies. In metallurgy, in mining, later oil, or even railroads themselves, a few men established huge fortunes in these new industries in a way that is not so dissimilar to technology in the past 30 years. This was a completely new phenomenon back then, and because there was a lack of regulation or efficient control of uh, business practices, they could sometimes have very brutal methods to take control of a market. They uh, removed their competition with dumping or sometimes even physically, by blocking their activity. Antitrust and consumer laws, the regulation of businesses, were a consequence of these new practices. But still, spectacular fortunes were built, and when it comes to railroads, they include names like Cornelius Vanderbilt, or Jay Gould, or the banker JP Morgan. Vanderbilt made his wealth initially in shipping. He was born in 1794, so when railroads appeared in America, he was already a mature and experienced businessman. He understood early that railroads were the future of transportation and would replace probably boats on waterways. So he invested heavily in them and ended up owning the New York Central Railroad, which was located in the Northeast. It connected New York City and Boston in the East with Chicago and St. Louis in the Midwest. He not only invested, he also organized. He embraced new forms of organization and management to deal with the increasing complexity of railroad networks and the economy in general. 
He was also one of the early users of the financial market and public companies to uh, gather capital and use it to compete. And he had a reputation for having uh, brutal business methods. Like other businessmen that also were successful at the time, he had a reputation for being uh, unscrupulous. By the end of the century, men like him were called robber barons for their exploitative practices. Controlling natural resources, influencing government by relations or even corruption, paying minimal wages, squashing competition by ruining and acquiring competitors. There is some truth to it. I mean, factually, robber barons did all this to maximize profit and grow even more. But they were probably driven more by the thirst for power and the urge to build companies than pure greed. They obviously liked wealth, but they often gave back a substantial part of it to charities, universities, churches, libraries, public buildings like museums. There was probably a part of calculation and public relations in this practice. But still, the fact that these robber barons worked until their last day seems to prove that their main drive was not just to amass wealth and enjoy it. Vanderbilt's fortune of the 1870s, adjusted for inflation, would amount to more than $200 billion of today. That is to say, something to the tune of Jess Bezos' fortune. One of his rivals, Hill Railroads, also based in New York, and uh, not more popular, was Jay Gould. Gould started investing in railroads, buying stocks, and uh, he took huge risks at the beginning, risks that paid off. In 1857, he took control of a company, the Rutland and Washington Railroad, in a panic that gave him the opportunity to buy stocks for 10 cents on the dollar. He kept investing in the stock market, but he knew how to better his odds by manipulating prices and using insider information. These practices are obviously totally illegal, but at the time they were harder to prove and actually quite common. He speculated on other industries and commodities. For example, he was involved in an attempt to corner the gold market, that is to say to buy enough to make the price artificially rise and then sell with a profit when the movement acquires a dynamic of its own because of panic buying by others. This time, this backfired and the price of gold collapsed suddenly in 1869. But Gould and his co-conspirator, another magnate called James Fisk, managed to escape prosecution thanks to their political connections. But this went public and Gould was one of the most hated of these robber barons. Maybe I'll make another story one day about robber barons because they all have a little story that is morally questionable but they were also empire builders and they represent an aspect of the times. There are many more in other industries like Andrew Carnegie and uh, Henry Frick for steel, John Jacob Astor with fur and real estate, Hearst in media, Rockefeller with oil, JP Morgan in banking. But let's return to the impact of railroads on American economy and society. Another consequence was that it stimulated the emergence of a private financial system. As I said earlier, the need for capital to fund the construction of railroads 
was bigger than ever seen before. To give you an idea, one mile of track costed the same as a new steamboat. So the construction of the first transcontinental line, which was 3,000 miles long, was equivalent to the cost of 3,000 boats. No single investor could pay for that, and banks were not large enough to lend that kind of money. It became necessary to organize a financial market of bonds and stocks, where investors, large and small, would contribute with their capital. Until the First World War, railroads were the basis and the largest industry on the American financial market. But railroads also changed the lives of ordinary Americans as workers and as consumers. Workers because railroads revolutionized management before them. Managerial techniques were much more simple, factories were smaller, and a company typically had only one. But when they started to produce in multiple locations, with factories that supplied each other, the need for rational organization and optimization appeared. Engineers became necessary to manage industrial and even services businesses. Railroad companies also grew much more complex with size. They became big employers of professional managers that organized the ever-growing traffic on their larger and larger system. One thing that made the organization even more complex is that most lines had a single track and trains ran in both directions. So when lines had dozens of stations and hundreds of clients for freight and passengers, can you imagine the scheduling and organization that this required? Work became much more time sensitive and probably more stressful than it used to be for all people involved. It changed the way people worked and the distribution of responsibilities within businesses. Consumers were also very much impacted. The variety of goods available increased dramatically. Costs dropped and the first steps of mass consumption began, still very modestly in comparison with what it became in the 20th century. But even the working class could now go to stores and occasionally buy manufactured goods. The development of railroads and department stores was contemporary. For a part, the logistic of large stores in cities depended on trains, on freight, and trains made it possible to operate such large stores. But even though America was urbanizing and the large cities were booming, the majority of the population still lived in small towns and villages. The proximity of a train station connected them with the big city, where most people could now go at least once in their lives. This opened new horizons and actually accelerated the growth of cities because they were attractive places to live. With department stores, another form of retail appeared to mail order and it also relied heavily on railroads. A success story in this category was Sears and Roebuck, which later opened stores but it began as a uh, mail-order retailer. They sent big catalogs by mail to consumers in every state, in cities but also small-town America, which was the market they targeted. Clients could take away their products at the nearest train station when they decided to buy. 
I'll add a link in the description to readings of sections of the Sears catalogue of 1897 by a channel and a podcast also called Boring Books for Bedtime if you want to give it a try. I find it very interesting because it shows not only the description and price of a huge range of goods, there is also the way they present their business to customers, they explain why their prices are supposedly much lower than their competitors, they try to create a complicity in the relationship with clients, using a mix of rational and emotional language. This is modern consumer marketing being invented and deployed across all types of consumers. And in the Sears catalog, they did it on all sorts of products, all sorts of goods, from books or musical instruments to agricultural equipment. Many of their customers were farmers. Yet another consequence, and this one was favorable for workers, was the uh, career path offered by railroads. They tended to pay better than other industries, and to retain their employees, they offered benefits, including some of the first pension schemes for blue-collar workers. Railroads hired men around 20, and as long as they stayed with the same employer, they had perspectives to evolve. First they would work on the tracks, then become firemen, team supervisors, and some of them could work their way up to the engineer, changing status and standards of living. Mechanics also had a career path. They could begin as shop workers and be formed by the company to become skilled mechanics and later freight and passenger conductors. So there were tangible advantages coming with trains. And railroads were very widely embraced by Americans, even without taking a train or waiting for a passenger, people in towns in the years 1830s and 40s would dress up on Sundays to go to the station and see the trains arrive. The vision of a massive locomotive traveling on hundreds of miles at high speed, only thanks to engineering and industrial processes. This was a breathtaking vision for the time. The same phenomenon appeared later with planes. In the first decades of aviation, people went to airports just to watch the planes take off and land, because it was marvelous and spectacular. And the stations were given an architecture that went well beyond mere functionality. Like in Europe, they became monuments with an impressive architecture and uh, ornamentation that distinguished them from other buildings of the industrial era. All American cities that were already of a significant size by the end of the 19th century have at least one impressive train station. For smaller towns, it became vital to be connected to a train line. Without it, decline and sometimes the disappearance of the town was almost unavoidable. So, cities and states also participated in the funding or the land grants to railroads to ensure they were not left aside. In front of this enthusiasm, there were few opponents, at least at the beginning. Some lobbies were hostile to railroads, like transporters on waterways, for obvious reasons. And when railroad construction picked up speed in the 1830s and 40s, a few authors and poets lamented the damages they would do to landscapes. <laughs> 
but this never weighed much. The more significant opposition arose from the 1870s, when railroads had gained considerable power, and it came from farmers in particular, because thanks to their monopolies in some regions, railroads could impose higher prices for transport. Laws were passed to fix maximum prices to stop abuse from them. But still, after the first two generations, once railroad had become a fact of life, their image became much more mixed. They were also symbols of monopolies, unhinged capitalism. They had a power of life or death on towns. Their owners had built fortunes, and there were several scandals related to their activity of collusion with politicians or market manipulation. So they also became vilified sometimes. And here again, the parallel with tech, media and online services in our age could make sense to some extent. Now the intense development of railroads didn't go without booms and bursts. It was never linear. The 1860s were a very favorable decade, despite the civil war. But in 1873, there was a financial crash that had severe economic repercussions almost until the end of the century, and a period of slow growth began before it reaccelerated at the turn of the century. In the years 1880s and 90s, most main lines had already been built, and investment slowed down. It was now time to reorganize and unify the American network, which was operated by dozens of companies. It was necessary to harmonize prices and facilitate long-distance travels. A lot of this restructuring was organized by J.P. Morgan, banker I talked about before. But the end of the Gilded Age was coming. The network peaked in length of trackage by 1916, with more than 250,000 miles of tracks. That is to say the equivalent to 10 times the circumference of the Earth. But in 1916, Railroads were already under attack, and the future would be quite different for them. The magic of the first decades, when people would gather to see trains pass by, and when there was a sense of progress and wonderful opportunities associated with the railroads, this enthusiasm was gone. Railroads had probably concentrated too much and uh, shared regions between them, giving them too much pricing power, so by the beginning of the 20th century, some were dissolved, broken into separate companies as a part of an antitrust policy, especially under President Theodore Roosevelt in the 1900s. Laws were passed to set maximum rates and review the company's financial records to ensure that their profitability was not too high. So, politically and socially, the positive image of railroads had evaporated, even though they were still vital as an industry. But the worst for them was yet to come. During the First World War, which the US entered in 1917, it appeared that the network, with all its private separate operators, was unable to adequately support the war effort, which was essentially about equipping and sending troops to Europe. So in 1917, the management was nationalized, 
signal to companies and the ownership of the drugs and rolling stock, but the US government took over management of railroads. And this lasted until 1920. This temporary nationalization had showed a weakness in the American railroad system. Private initiative supported by the state had been very good at creating a large network, the largest in the world, and uh, at lifting the entire economy with it. But the multiplicity of operators and companies also meant that facilities were duplicated, prices were all over the place, and due to their specificities, it is hard to choose between private and public management of railroads. The private sector had done wonders at creating and developing what was now the biggest American industry, but if it was left alone, tended to create regional monopolies that penalized the consumer. Regulation didn't work that well, neither, because when these monopolies were broken, the system tended to become inefficient. The option chosen in the 1920s was to let railroads operate as businesses, but with a tighter and tighter control over their prices and uh, a forced consolidation that would create larger regional systems. Before this was implemented anyway, railroads were already starting to decline. After World War I, the automobile era had truly begun, and the wonders of the day were no longer locomotives, but individual cars and uh, trucks that could compete with trains and were much more flexible to transport people or freight from one point to another. And then came 1929 and the depression of the 1930s. Like all other sectors, railroads nosedived. Many small railroads failed and were not rescued by the government. The policy in the first years of the recession was to let businesses die, which was understandable but also fed the depression. The survivors were unable or uninterested in supporting the weaker ones, and the downturn of the whole industry, the financial losses, meant that the excess profitability of railroad companies was no longer an urgent problem. The new issue was more to keep them alive, to avoid further damage to the economy. Even though the depression was overcome, American railroads never recovered. The time of their splendor had really gone. After World War II, in the 1940s and 50s, the automobile boom accelerated even more. The government and the country were still interested in infrastructure, but railroads had been the priority of the previous century. Highways and better paved roads were now the new priority. And on top of that, airlines were now competing for passenger traffic on long distance. Along the 1950s and 60s, most railroads abandoned passenger train service except in very dense areas for short distance trips, like along the East Coast. For many Americans, the practice of using trains is something that disappeared in this period, which is a big difference with countries like Japan, the UK, Germany or France, where trains are still a part of life for national journeys because the distances are shorter and generally the governments have taken over and nationalized, if not the entire operation, at least the infrastructure with the tracks and the stations. So for American railroads, income sources were shrinking. The need to invest had uh, never disappeared. Tracks had to be maintained and rolling stock had to be modernized. After the age of steam, 
diesel and electricity replaced it to power locomotives. Passenger cars had to be replaced too. And it appeared in the 1960s that the industry was no longer viable in its current form. So it was nationalized. A company owned by the government, Amtrak, was created for passenger traffic. It still operates long distance lines, but its market share is now very small against airlines and uh, it is uncommon for Americans to use trains for such travels. The only uh, region of America where there is uh, a quite intense railroad traffic is on the east coast as many people still use them daily to go to work and back to where they live. Freight activities were more viable because they remain competitive on long distance. Transcontinental lines still work to carry heavy loads from coast to coast and across the Midwest. Freight is operated today by various railroads that have been deregulated again since the 1980s and there has been a little revival of freight due to the rise in fuel costs that made road transport more expensive and the construction of new terminals near ports where containers can be directly loaded and taken away. Obviously, American railroads are now the shadow of what they used to be when it comes to their importance in daily life. And taking into account all the social and economic changes that they once brought. But they're not dead. And there are projects being studied or already under construction for high-speed train systems for passengers. One is functioning in Florida, and there is a big project in California that should connect Los Angeles to San Francisco in under three hours, but it should not open before 2033. Hope you liked it, and I'll speak to you soon.